Hey, what's up, briefers? So the 135 gallon tank was having some issue, well, still is having some issue with Zoa's closing, and I have kind of like a hint of idea of what's going on, and I'm currently working on it, and hopefully we'll have some kind of resolution. But for today, we're gonna take a break from the 135 gallon tank, and we're gonna focus on a mangrove tank. Let's go. Ah, the mangrove tank. This tank is so easy, so straightforward that I think if I were to set up just one reef tank when I don't have a lot of time, this is the way to go. It consists mostly of softies, LPS, and maybe in the future I can add a little bit SPS. I'm sure they can sustain it, but in terms of like ease of care, I prefer softies and LPS all day. So in a lot of my previous videos, I've covered the basics of this mangrove tank. What I wanna to do today is kind of give you a quick update on how it sits right now some things have changed. And more importantly, I'm gonna spend some time and talk about my future plan for this particular tank. As always, as I share my thoughts, I would love to hear your feedback on what you think of those ideas as well as any suggestions that you may have because this is a two-way street. You are my reefing buddies and I would love to get your opinion as well. So let's get to it. So typically when I talk about this tank, I usually save the mangrove to the end of the update. Figure this time I'll kind of do the reverse, talk about the mangrove first. Mangrove, as you can see, a couple weeks ago, I lopped off the top portion of the tree, hoping to uh, re redirect the hormone to the other branches, lower branches, and encourage it to spread out sideways versus upwards. And first of all, I wanna make sure that the mangrove does not die from this. And so far, it seems okay. The wound is closed up. As expected, I feel like the growth has become a little bit more vigorous towards the uh, the other tip. All these branches right here, like these guys right here, seems to be, um, it seems to have spurred something on. I feel like it had worked. Long term, it remains to be seen how the mangrove tree react to this trimming, but my hope is that these guys right here, these guys, it's gonna get more bushy and starts umbrellaing out versus like it was like going upwards towards the light. Done with the mangrove parts, let me turn off that light and then we'll talk about extra tank. Since we're sort of doing things in reverse this week, figure it would be fun to talk about the fish now versus a little bit later like I usually do in, uh, in videos. So for fish wise, these fish are getting really, really comfortable with me. That includes this little blenny right here. Every single day uh, before I start the day, I kind of like sit in my seats in front of my computer, uh, reach over for this food right here and immediately you can see the blenny already kind of swimming up towards, uh, <laughs> towards the food. Bang guy is usually a lot more uh, outgoing, but because I have a camera right now, they're kind of shy. But uh, as always, let's go ahead and feed the fish first. Okay, and I like to just eat it into the water column, as the kids would call it these days. Interestingly, the blenny does not really go after the little pellets. Maybe it's because like uh, the blenny couldn't see it too, too well. But the, the cardinal fish absolutely love it. Maybe it is the larger, particulate or like flake size, but the blenny really likes flakes and this is either the prime reef or the uh, uh, Omega flakes like any kind of flakes the blenny just go right after as you can see right here It's probably like larger target for it. And it's really cool too. The blenny kind of dart out grab the food and roll back uh, Cardinal just like the pellets readily go after prepared food. I know uh, sometimes Cardinal is a little bit tricky in terms of feeding uh, prepared food. So okay, one of these Cardinals, the uh, initial one, I lost one, I replaced it. Initially when I first have the original pair, they did not like prepared food at all. They don't even eat it. So I need to feed them frozen. I ended up losing one of them. So with just one bang guy remaining, I thought, okay, I'll get one more to uh, to form a pair. And how I normally do is I'll get a, I'll get two, right? Well, I'll, I'll get a trio. And then I'll let them pair off and I remove the uh, man out, and, which is what I did here. But a cool thing is that the, the two that I got later on, I made sure they eat at the petco that I picked them up from. And they were eating flake food. So that was perfect. And the new fish, or the two new fish, train the old fish to eat prepared food. Because a lot of times people ask, like, how do you get your uh, Benga Cardinals to take flakes and pellets? And honestly, I did not. They came that way, and the, uh, the new one that took flake food readily uh, taught the old one. Now, once they paired up, I gave away the uh, the odd man out, uh, which happened to be one of the um, the new one. I know there are ways to tell whether they're male or female based on jaw size, or some people say the uh, back fin size. But uh, honestly, I don't have any like solid. What do you? Oh, you're female in your work hours. No, man, it's lunchtime. Stop getting me in trouble. Stop! 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 I'm working. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Jesus, it's trying to get me in trouble. What are you doing? Don't you have work to do? Get out of here, get out of here. Get out of here. 
<laughs> Before we were so rudely interrupted, we kind of touch on the fish here, and we'll talk a little bit more about future plan, but I have future plan with these guys. All right, so the other fish in this tank is this guy right here um, that's kind of resting next to the suction cup of the heater, and that is the Atlantic oyster blenny. Initially I got this guy thinking it's a uh, Monty Miller blenny, good to help with the um, aptasia issues, but it turns out this guy is uh, a lightning oyster blenny. Still a cool character, still a cool character, um, but uh, he may nip at clams and LPS, so I figured this tank is probably a more appropriate space for this blenny. So far the blenny seems to be behaving and kind of pretty much leave the cardinal fish alone but I feel like later on if it appears that the blenny is kind of bugging the cardinals so much that they are not kind of doing the thing then I may rehome the blenny. Look he swam out a little bit. Check out these guys. This guy is uh, totally tame. Can I even use the word tame with fish? This tank started out as a macroalgae mangrove tank. Now the mangrove is still here but the macroalgae is pretty much down to the red high, which I love very much, don't get me wrong. But you may be wondering what happened to other macroalgae. Now a lot of the other macroalgae, the green ones, got completely destroyed by the ammo crab that I moved here. Uh, where's that guy? We lovingly call this Ammo crab, the Xenia warrior princess or warrior prince, because at one point he somehow got Xenia to grow on his uh, legs and he was moving around with it. But it looks like he molted again and the Xenia is gone, sadly. Now, this guy was a huge fan of that red spiny macroalgae, which is fine with me because all these bubble algae was growing in there. And uh, speaking of bubble algae, you know what? I noticed that there's no more bubble algae in this tank too, probably thanks to the crab. Anyways, this crab mowed down those spiny red macro algae. And then there's another type, I think it's the feather, uh, green calibris, that he really likes. So he mowed those down too. I was like, okay, fine. I like high, I like the palm tree macro. I'm okay with the tank just having those type of macro algae because it's getting a little bit messy at that point as well. So I was cool with it. Next thing I know, the palm tree calibris went from here all the way to here, which is not good because this is my soft coral island and Gorgonian island. I want to keep it that way. And um, I realized that, you know what, there is like this whole portion of the tank is being shaded by this uh, finger letter right here. Uh, so as a result, nothing is really growing here and I don't want the macro growing here. So I just kind of pulled the palm tree macro, who was doing really well by the way. But unfortunately it's, it grew all the way around to the backside of here. So it's kind of funky. It's kind of did a lap here. So at the end I decided to just go ahead and remove the palm tree uh, calibras because it's just did not fit into the scape at all. I would like to still grow some stuff here, but at the moment, the way the light is situated, uh, this coral just shading too much of this portion of the tank to uh, grow any calibras there. So unfortunately, uh, this part is empty and along with it went all the macroalgae. That's why this tank right now is essentially like a soft coral, gorgonian, and mangrove tank. I need to change the name of the series. To be honest, I'm okay with it because I feel like a reef tank is ever evolving. Uh, at the moment, it's not the best spot for a macro LG tank uh, with the way the light is situated, the way the core is shading lights to this portion of the tank that I got budgeted for macro LG. And the fact that we have a huge macro LG predator right here. Uh, this guy, sometimes I hand feed him. Uh, this guy's really, really bold. I'll try to get it on camera sometimes. And I need to feed him because it got to the size where I don't think just scavenging around the tank is enough to satisfy him. Uh, but the fortunate thing is that he did not really go after any of the uh, fleshy LPS yet. So fingers crossed. Dude. Have I shown you recently how large this ammo crab and mangrove tech has gotten? Look at the size of this. Oh, just heads out of the bag. <laughs> Can't trick you guys. You guys are too smart. Continuing to the outer coral in this tank, uh, we see the Space Invader Pectinia looking amazing. For whatever reason, it just loves this tank. The Kryptonite seems to be bleaching out a little bit. Well, it's not really bleaching out, but it's not as poofy as I would have liked. So I probably need to do a water test. And kind of like a fun little info for this tank, I did not do any water test except for checking for salinity. Um, I think like from the beginning, almost like from the beginning of this tank, maybe I've done one or two. But in this year, I did not do any specific test for like alkalinity, calcium, magnesium, even magnesium, because like mangrove tree, they appreciate magnesium, but I did not do any of those tests. I did not test for nitrate, did not test for phosphate. I just relied on how the coral looks to kind of get a sense of things. I feel like whenever a coral looks a little bit pale, 
kind of like that. I feel like the phosphate or nitrate may be a little bit low. So I may actually pull out the test kit to test, but I have not really test uh, this tank at all. I really just rely on the water change to keep the water parameters where I want it to be. I trust that it goes there because of the uh, more regular water change this tank gets. And I usually change water. I try to aim for every two weeks, but to be honest, it usually lands on maybe like every three or four weeks or sometimes in five weeks. I mean, there's something to be said about a really simple reef tank that you don't have to do a lot of maintenance on. Now, would I pull something like this on a tank that has SPS like the one I got downstairs? I would not. <laughs> and that's why I'm dosing for that tank because there's more consumption in the tank with the corals that I have. These SPS, LPS, a lot hardier, not as demanding. Um, so some people say that, yeah, you can do tank like this because you keep easy corals and they're totally right. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. So continuing with the corals, we got the uh, Japanese pink nithias growing well. I took, I think, two frags from this for Reef of Penisa in New York, and they totally grew back and then some. So I think I may actually take one frag and uh, keep it in the 135 gallon downstairs just to see if they grow a little bit different uh, under different environments. And we got the lemon yellow or lime green one in the back as well. Another coral that I really like that's relatively common is this guy right here. This letter came from my good friend Joseph and I really like this especially when this gets to a certain size because of this beautiful flowy white polyp and um, the one Joseph got is like a huge size in this tank right now. This coral look absolutely gorgeous when it gets to a certain size and you just see all these uh, white tip tentacle waving in the in the in the water currents. Uh, I don't think there's any name to this, but this is an absolutely gorgeous piece that came from Joseph. And you see these like weird green ones that looks kind of sad in the back and I essentially just fracked them from the 135 because I feel like they may be touching other corals and they may be doing coral warfare kind of stuff. So I was like, all right, let's frag it. Let's make sure no corals touching. Uh, so that's why these guys are right here. These are the same guys and I noticed that they take on different like uh, coloration and formation based on the environment they're under. All right, hang in there. We're almost done the update and then we'll talk about future plan of this tank. So. We cannot not talk about this ginormous finger letter right here. This is one of the biggest piece of coral in this tank and I'll give you a look of it from different perspective. This guy, I had no idea how much it liked this light. I had no idea because it's like a letter coral, right? But it's growing into the light. It loves flow, it's growing right in front of the power head. It used to be just on this side, right? This side of the tank, but it actually grew into the flow as well. So it likes high flow and high lights as long as I guess you acclimate to them. And it's to the point where it's blocking the flow. I cranked the MP10 actually all the way up to 75% now. It used to be like 40% and I could like provide enough circulation for the whole tank. But now I gotta crank it all the way up because now it's blocking the flow. So what can I say? Um, when you let a coral just kind of grow into a commonly size, it's, uh, it looks beautiful. And to be honest, like if you put this in nature, this is like a tiny frag, right? Uh, but in this particular tank, this is considered like a mini colony. I mean, it takes up a good chunk of the tank. I absolutely love it. I find that the coloration of this coral and um, the, the, I guess like the form, that it has under higher light and higher flow to be absolutely gorgeous, almost like a SPS that moves, which is the best of both worlds. Same thing with the Xenia. I feel like if you give them enough light, these Xenias look a little bit more pale, right? They look beautiful versus like if they're under really low lights, poor border circulation, they look really tan and then they get a little bit stringy and it's not as full, it doesn't look as nice. So give the corals the environment they want and they'll look beautiful for you. And check out the Gorgonian as well. These are the Gorgonians that I moved from the 135. I was kind of holding my breath. I was hoping that um, they'll maintain how they look in the 135. And they definitely did. They're still fuzzy. They're still growing. Uh, the color did not brown out. It still looked really, really nice, crisp, pale. I love that look. Um, this one kind of grew kind of wonky because it's kind of off to one side. But you can see this guy right here and this guy. Oh, look at this. Ammo crab is out. Look at how large this guy is. This guy is chunky. Although I am kind of sad that it lost his Xenia. Hmm? Huh? Still filming? Yeah. What up? <laughs> okay. <laughs> now to round out the coral collection, I also added some green stop polyp to this tank. I got a couple different morph. I believe this is the Dave's Nano Tank morph that I got from uh, uh, Mr. Billy Pipes a while back. It's growing well. Uh, I feel like I'm not 
hitting it with enough flow or light so it's not fully out. This is as much as I get. So I may need to move it more into the flow. And the other type is that type of the white center of metallic green. That is the ones I used to have in the uh, Frogfish 17 gallon drop off tank. I like it because the coloration is really, really metallic green. Right now, I don't think the location is also ideal and it's also stinging my uh, Space Invader Pectini. I can see a little bit of skeleton. They have been situated like that for a while, so I suspect the war has actually been happening for a little bit. So I do need to move that piece of rock right there. All right, y'all, future plan for this tank. I feel like to this point, I have not really gave this tank enough uh, attention, <laughs> that makes sense. Right now, I think a lot of things kind of like growing where I placed them, which is fine, right? For the most part, it's fine. But there are certain things that I wish I can do differently. For example, better address this space right here. This space, I feel like I could do a lot better. And um, I don't really want to touch this ladder, but I may have to address this piece as covering the power head. Or maybe even add another power head to kind of solve this issue where it's blocking the flow. So that's number one in terms of the aesthetic of the tank. I feel like overall, it's, it's, it's okay. Could be better. Number two, in terms of the livestock, um, like I mentioned a little bit earlier in this video, I would like to try to breed and then raise the fries of the Bangai Cardinal fish. Now, I feel like they are probably large enough, right? They're chunky enough, probably healthy enough, happy enough, I hope, maybe in the mood enough to start maybe doing a little breeding action. What I really need to do now is provide solid quality food to really encourage that. So I think like uh, my next step is probably start feeding um, potentially live food, like live black worms or something that's like really nutrient rich and see if we can get things moving along. And I think like the following step after that is to actually include a long tentacle anemone in this tank. I've been on the hunt for a nice deep purple coloration long tentacle anemones. And the reason I want long tentacle anemone is because long tentacle anemones is the natural host of this Bengai cardinal fish. And not a lot of people know it. <laughs> I kind of randomly came across this information as well. I was like, oh, really? The, the, the Google search is like, oh. Really? So long tentacle anemone is the natural host and also when the fries or these fish are traveling across the ocean floor, they will go into the spines of long spine urchin. So I feel like a long spine urchin may be a really interesting addition to this tank as well, but I was hesitant because this was supposed to be a macroalgae tank and I know urchin mold down macroalgae, but little do I know that the ammo crab is gonna take care of that problem for me. So maybe a long spine urchin would be in the future of this tank as well. Although with a long spine urchin, I'll absolutely have to supplement feeding because right here in this tank, it's not gonna be enough algae or green matters for the uh, urchin as well as that nice size ammo crab. In terms of where the blenny is gonna go, we'll see how the blenny behaves. So far, he seems to be behaving as a model citizen. So I think he can probably stay in this tank. So this covers the fish as well as the aquascape of this tank. When I'm gonna add more macroalgae to this tank, I would like to, but I'm not sure which type the ammo crab is gonna leave alone. So for now, the high yield will work. I may experiment with different macroalgae as we go along. For gorgonians, I'm happy with what we got. Um, I may potentially add more of these type because I really like the look and feel of this type. Or maybe I just frag some and just plant them somewhere else. But in terms of like real estate, we are seriously running out. So I'm kind of go easy on here. I may, again, like I mentioned, rethink the flow and light situation of this tank, especially for this particular part. If there's a way to bring some light to this particular part of the tank, that would be fantastic. And I really don't want to hang one more light up here because I feel like, come on, Radeon G4 Pro, more than enough. The other bit that I thought would be interesting to do with this tank is to keep some of the more common known uh, corals in this tank versus the higher end stuff. So in my 145 gallon tank, you see like Go Torch, Go Hammer, blah, 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 all those like OG Bounce, big, big name stuff. But for this tank, you notice I'm keeping like Xenius, right? Letter, letter, Gorgonian. Green stop polyps, leather, kind of like the um, more common or beginner kind of corals. I want to show that they can be beautiful as well. I feel like most people already know that they can be beautiful, but at the same time, um, not a lot of people out there kind of dedicate a full tank to these kind of um, easier or less sought after, or less sought after, yeah, that's the right word, uh, coral. And I would love to show that um, by putting them together in a proper way, uh, they can be absolutely beautiful and stunning as well. And I feel like uh, the reason they're so affordable is because they're so much hardier and easier, which it's kind of like a double-edged sword. Uh, kind of like the budgies 
of the parrots world, right? The budgies, those little parrots, they're actually really, really intelligent. They're one of the smartest parrots in terms of like learning speech. But maybe not the smartest, but definitely more so than some of the more pricier counterparts in the parrots world. But because of the fact that it's so abundant, when people see that, oh, it's $25, they don't give them much thoughts, um, kind of overlook some of their better quality simply because of affordable. We put a strange association in terms of like value versus I guess how good uh, something is, which may work in some places, but doesn't make sense in other places. And in this particular case, I feel like uh, we want to make a case that, okay, something affordable and easy is not necessarily worse than something that's more expensive and harder to come by. So that's the goal of this tank at this point, as well as try my hands on breeding some of this uh, Bangai Cardinal fish. Also really affordable, also really abundant, at least in captivity. In the wild, they're almost extinct, I believe. Is that a vermited snail right here? Did they invade this tank too? Oh no, man. Reef pest. That's another topic that we gotta talk about. I think I have pretty much had most kind of pests. Emily in the back is like smiling, be like, what the heck, man? Just do but yeah, maybe we can do a live stream on it uh, because I feel like a lot of people have expertise in this area, much more expertise in this area than me. So, anyways, that's for another video. For now, let's wrap this up. Otherwise, my wife's gonna kill me. All right, I'll see you guys next Sunday at 12 p.m. shop. See ya. Do you see what I'm seeing?